Welcome to my stream where knowledge reigns supreme. Call me collected. I'm about to go live. You know what I mean. Got high expectations. Gonna teach you something new. Learn it and you can Connected to channel fix at 42. Fixerbot says. T minus four minutes. To my stream, where knowledge reigns supreme. Call me collected. I'm about to go live. You know what I mean. Got high expectations. Gonna teach you something new. Learn it. Why? What is this site? Come on. Welcome to my stream, where knowledge reigns supreme. Call me collected. I'm about to go live, you know what I'm Stream about to start, one minute left.
log in. So I just managed to log in there. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So we were doing the proposal one. So why is it not in like the list? Because this is favorites, okay? Modules. So. Hmm. Well, so on Triacme, you just have a dashboard with your what you're on actually doing, not favorite modules. Why would this? I I don't think I ever favorited this. <coughs> I think it's automatic. Um, yeah. So here we have in progress model modules. Shouldn't this be more? So this is finished. Okay. Um, so did I log into the account I thought was deleted or gone? And I don't think so because I think it had more than the introduction. And this one is not done either. So that's probably why it was like a favorite because it wasn't finished, you know? Oh well, oh well. Let's let's click again. Let's log in there. We'll just hop to the page, right? I'll need to log out. Uh, so their new login system is more than annoying. So let's try this email address that was also here. I guess I'll do remember me. Uh, it does not match anything because it was deleted. So, all oh, right. So maybe I should just click this one. Continue with HTTP account, and there where that's where I log in. Ah. <sighs> so I don't think this is the correct one. I think I'm using this one. We'll see. Let's actually do this one. I didn't click remember me now. And that's probably the right one then. Yeah, binary. <laughs> yeah, we have a ad lock. Okay. Take me use both chat won't load. Okay. Yeah, so I've had problems. What was it? Some site I had to turn off U block and uh, privacy badger that I didn't believe I would have to. But uh, anyway, we, we just clicked a few of these to test stuff. And I think that one of them was um, expensive in their blocks or what they're called. But uh, so I thought it would say like, you can't do this. But apparently the like bits of it, you don't really pay for it until you click the separate parts. Whatever. <laughs> Let's just continue. So we're at the very end of this and I didn't have time uh, to test again because in all of this room they're doing something very odd and the very odd thing is to make a uh, uh, an exploit connecting by to, to your own, to the machine's own IP, to local host. And I was like, seriously, this is so odd. Let's just do my machine. And that didn't work. So I'm thinking that we'll just have to do as they say we should do, which is annoying. Uh, but we'll just have to spawn the system. And uh, finish this, because I want to get started with the Windows one. Uh, that's the next. The same thing, stack based buffer overflows on Linux, but on Windows. Right, x86. <coughs> so, targets over spawning. Uh, I had helped my mom a bit uh, to get service on her car, so I've been messing about with that for over an hour now. So I would have started streaming earlier than usual today if 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 stuff didn't happen, like my mom getting in a very apparently scary alarm on her car saying she has to go to service. So though it's not very explicit the message. Um 
So it should probably say uh, you should go to service, not a countdown, counting down the days. <laughs> Until like, it was one year in service, I guess. But it says like 10 days left to go. <laughs> no details. Uh, it's not that old that, that she got worried, really. It's kind of... Oh, right, I, my camera didn't work, so I had to restart uh, my computer. That's probably because I was messing with the snap camera yesterday and got it working. So, but I didn't want to use the resources to actually run it all the time. So, uh, I had everything started, then I had to restart. So, now, there. So, we have TTS working. We have... Uh, stream to YouTube and Twitch working. Kali has started. Now I can even switch screens. So <coughs> there. So I have to wake my mom up at uh, it's seven tomorrow. But she wanted to be woken up at five thirty to be able to leave home at 8.15. So uh, I think she will manage with seven. I hope so, because I, I don't think I will be able to get up at, at 5.30. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, uh, right. VPN. Oh, the Academy. Apparently it's a separate VPN, I don't know why, why they have two. I don't think they'll run up to IP addresses, will they? Maybe they will. Sounds very... I guess it's good to have a lot, right? But still... It's a bit of a mess to have, have to have two. Oh gosh, caps? How did that happen? It's not like it's hard to type two letters, so I guess. So let's go here. And let's check. We have an IP over here. So if I click this, will it copy it? Yes. So let's uh, Zage and it's like almost the same address, whatever. Mm, it's not the same though. I think we got one once we got the same address. Oh, and the password is htb underscore at academy stu student. Uh, I'm copying this. Oh. Ah, uh, that's me pressing Control Shift. Let's see. Oh gosh. What I did was to actually copy again on Kali instead of paste. There now. So. Here we have the leave message. We'll have to. I don't think we have to read or anything because I think it's very the same memory addresses and everything. So the purpose is really to read this message text. Uh, I think I was kind of like test going to test the try hack me runes uh, exploit. But let's let's actually do both. But I feel like these are a bit messy. I mean, if this doesn't work to connect, let's look at the notes so you know what I'm talking about. So I have to open the notes again too. So uh, if we go to the very bottom here, we should have like what we're currently doing because I added it from uh yeah so this is the current full example we're testing here so we noticed this uh, 
So I just have to disconnect the phone. Okay. Come on. Oh, well, that was a bit funny. I, by mistake, I clicked uh, the button for pause when I was just removing the phone from, from the stand. Oh, uh, that's, that's annoying. I'll have to be more careful when I do that. Anyway, let's go back to this. Uh, so, this uh, executable here, leave message, has a vulnerability. We found this buffer overflow. Uh, we tested with 2500 characters, probably, since we used that here. And uh, so it was kind of a large buffer. We don't have the code for this one, so we don't know exactly what, what's inside it. Um, though we did uh, disassemble it. I, f I feel like that's a bit of cheating, right? But it was a bit too much to read anyway. Um, I mean, not worth it. So anyway, then we did run it with this and we get this place in memory where it actually tries to return to, right? So then we got the exact position of this. Uh, and this is where uh, the return address or the address we want to redirect execution to will be put later. Uh, but then we were, oh, we found bad characters. I, that's too much to cut paste into the notes. So I just skipped that. Um, and then we have, so it's on lost stream if you if you're curious or maybe it's not on before even. Uh, so recently I haven't had time to stream for a long time. It's, I I kind of felt it's good to do some exercising too to get your body in shape. Uh, so I've been doing that. Here, this is the one where I changed it. So I put my IP here. Let's see if we have the same IP today. Yeah. Uh, instead of 137.001, that was the suggested one. Uh, so I guess we will do the suggested numbers here instead of this, this time. And uh, yeah, C format of the output architecture x86, platform Linux, and we the bad cars we found there. Uh, we could like put this here. To making this a more complete example. With actually uh, finding bad cars. So these are just temporary because I was closing my VM down. Um, I really would have wanted to finish this during the weekend at least, but I haven't really had time, not even yesterday. So many things to do. Um, found 11, should I deny? And this is not what we'll use now then because of the IP. I think I have the other one still here. So their default one, no, I replaced it. So in my example here, I had their one. So if this one works, as the other one didn't, it, it is definitely something like limited on the box then, right? That you can't access ours. Uh, let's, let's not go ahead of myself. Uh, I, I was going to paste more stuff where I didn't. Anyway, it connects when it's run. Only we can't do anything, right? At least I tried LSPVD. God didn't get any replies from this at all. Um, maybe it would have worked to do ID. I didn't try ID. Um, anyway, we'll have to run it again. Yeah, here it is. So. 
So this is of course supposed to be at the very end, since that's what we got there. So oh, we'll have to run and we'll have to find him again. Um, with the default information, we can check in the room instead of having to actually manually make a line. I'm, I'm more like after what they want us to do, right? So, determine length, bad character, generating shell code. Here we will have uh, the method venom command that they used, 127, the local host. I was like, why? No, I don't want to do this. Also, they do an out file and then they echo the out file. I'm like, why? So, I... I did a control shift again. So, control C. Right, so, yeah, they're cutting it. They're putting it in a file and then they're cutting it and copying it from here. So why not not make an out file? I'm just like, slightly annoyed. I, I shouldn't complain about stuff, I know. So it's great that this exists and that it's free, because it's free. So, uh, let's actually do a new try here. So this will of course not be in our main buffer overflow notes later. Um, but uh, new try yeah, doing it locally instead of trying to connect to my machine. And, uh, all right, it's already there. Uh, actually, we can try the actual one I sent here first. So I was messing about with saying starting program. But here is the run command. There. So if we were to run this, and it was the usual 443, not this, any other port. Uh, let's open a new tab uh, and let's listen, right? And just giving this a second chance. So let's GDB, uh, let's do the queue so we don't get the licensing information. Uh, we still have the glitches in in connection there. Leave. I did click tab. Nothing. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think the GDB ones we have to type. Maybe dot slash tab would work. So it's done. Now we're going to run it with this command. And there. And let's see if it's connected. It did. So it's not that it's not working, you know. It's just that it's not replying. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll have to do another SSH. This is what we did in the example, right? So I followed along with our example first. Uh, so we'll have to SSH to the same thing again. And uh, I don't remember the IP, so... Let's just copy this. Uh, we could clear this so it's a bit prettier, right? So, yeah, right, I still have to go there because I don't remember their password. So, password. Here. There. And just control C this time. So now we have one here and one here. And we will use their part to just be safe here. 
shouldn't think yourself. You just should copy whatever they did, no? I think it's a bit sad, actually, that we... So we will listen on 31, 31, 37, just to make sure that we're not, like, messing their thing up. So, let's see. Uh, I want to pee. Uh, 31, 3 and 37. So we're listening on the same box. Though it is a sewage, so we will have other permissions, right? That's the reason we're doing this, to get the permissions. Not to connect to another machine, really, so... But they could have done it another way. Doesn't MSF Venom have payloads that just get a shell? We'll have to test that too, because now I'm curious, why did they do it like this? And no bad things said about this, right? <laughs> this one, zero. Now I'm even more curious what we're supposed to read and why this reads zero. Hmm? Wasn't this what we're supposed to read, and we're not supposed to have read permissions? No? What is What are we supposed to read then? This is the message we're writing. So we're supposed to read something else. We'll have to look, actually, because this is good to know, you know. What are we supposed to read? Okay, road flag. Okay, that's that's nice. No complaints. Oh, so I'm going to open a third tab just to make the, the exploit. So now we're doing it. I just didn't copy the out file so we get the normal text. So my kid's knocking. Well, let's just click that. Yes, you bad. So I'm trying to get my 16 year old to microwave some pancakes in the house. Uh, but he's autistic and he's got this thing with cleanliness. So it's, it's tough. Uh, we'll see if he does it himself. <laughs> uh, I don't think so, but we can always hope. Right, so we have the code. Uh, we just edit this. Um, so let's we, we, we'll never use this again right so we don't need to copy this to any special place um let's just change the format so first of all uh to skip the annoying hoppiness of it uh 
there and let me just delete there so now we have this as one big thing and what I recently copied to this one uh, here let's let's copy it again and update it so let's do it like this and let's just take this one so copy and write uh, so when I created this let's just double check I'm 99% sure that it was the same characters yeah I'm 100% sure it was the same bad characters so we don't have to like update it yeah so I had I was doing like example 1 example 2 and then I removed it when I realized it was the same so 100% sure uh, so these we copy into here and we could also probably see right right so it's encoded uh, it's 95 right so this is not correct we have 256 yeah and these are 95 yeah yeah that's it's good there so and then 2060 is to the start of this address it is this is all calculated to get this at the right point so it is after this calculation so we do minus this number and minus this number to get the correct spot here, which is 2060 from our calculation earlier. Let's just scroll up there here. This is where it got the segmentation fault. It tried to hop to this address uh, and it, this is the position of it. Right, so that's what we're supposed to go to. So uh, this should instead now connect instead of this one uh, that we tried just a bit ago and now we're trying to connect to our I'm like do I even hear audio <laughs> let to test let's let's test send a message see that it works as we cheat. fix it says yeah good. test good again so um i have not had time to to check my automatic messages either apparently something is off i don't know what could have happened to stream or bad um there are updates i know i haven't updated though so uh, let's go back this one is listening on port 31327 and here we're now going to do the run again, but a new one. And this one will connect to the local machine instead. Uh, it's still the same address here. The only change is that in this, all the bytes here, in here we have the encoded this, our local host IP instead, uh, and the port. So start it from the beginning, yes. Um, so, nothing. So, we don't have any connection here. Let's just restart it. Um, let's check this. Uh, first of all, uh, we can just do a simple test by changing these all to uh, 
Well, let's do 55s. Well, 66s. We did 66s before. It's it's slow. When I move my cursor, it doesn't move. There. So now we should get a folder already at this address. And if it doesn't, we'll have to check. Yeah, so this it's, it's going to the right address, right? And... Uh, I think we can probably check memory. Yeah, we should probably like do a breakpoint and check if we want to double check. Uh, so this should work, you know. Uh, unless this would have changed and not anymore be the correct address. But if it would not have been the correct address, then this would probably have been something else. So on this position, that's where it ends up probably after here. You know, after it's already done its thing. So I'm a bit curious uh, where this is. Let's go back up in the notes because uh, I don't want to miss anything here. So I know that this is not a like notes friendly bit of it. Uh, but here we have where we found here is where the shell code starts. Here is where we start our knobs. And to get this, we did set a breakpoint, right? Yeah, so I'm like removing this almost because it annoys me, but it's maybe not obvious. Um, yeah, going back. Here's MSF Venom accounts. Yeah, I did save theirs too. So let's just delete this because uh, there's no purpose. I'll keep it in the how the command works. But... So this is the other one. I think I tried it too last time. Let's do a quick test, right? So, no, no, I want to check the address first. Um, here, uh, we need to have a breakpoint. I'm a bit sad that I don't remember where I put the breakpoint because because I disassemble it because to to find it. I guess I'll have to do it again. Oh, I have. Hi, welcome opinion in. says. Welcome in. Hello. Welcome in. Yeah, so I'm like stuck at the same place here. Though I instead of using uh, a connect to my machine, which worked last time. Now I tried. To, to itself as the example is, um, but it didn't even pop anything up there. So since I've restarted the machine and everything, I'm thinking maybe, maybe something goes wrong here. Um, so uh, this is not what I'm going to do. I'm going to do set a breakpoint, but let's just do. We probably don't need to do it all. I think I F. No, totally wrong. Take a five so minutes info. break and come back to it, maybe. Functions. Yeah, I, I'm taking four days break from it. <laughs> so that's that's not the problem. Yeah. So I think we used before. Fair enough. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, we'll, we'll have to disassemble it. Uh, so I'm, I have this up, checking the disass. So let's disass main. Is it just slow or didn't I type anything? Yeah. Sometimes it's slow, so it's hard to know. So if we check the calls here. I wish I had some idea what you're doing, but this is much more advanced than anything I look at. Yeah, but I can explain if it's something you don't understand. So uh, this is the main function and uh, uh, this is the assembler instructions when it's disassembled. And we don't need to know right now much more than that we need to make a call uh, or we need to make a breakpoint at some position in this so we can look at memory while the program is still running. And that's why I'm checking for the last call in the main. Um, possibly we should do leave message. We can do leave message. We can put a breakpoint when this function starts running and look at memory there right uh, let's do that so we can uh, we can continue the disassembling by pressing return and we get the rest of it we could have pressed q not to get this last bit um uh, you can also look at my notes because i have all of these things right i explanations of all the bits of buffer overflow before here. Anyway, we put a breakpoint. Now we can look at memory and we can use these commands that I have over here uh, to see. So we can use this for example. So it's just getting a big chunk of memory we're looking at. Um, paste. Oh, we got an extra character there. So ESP is a stack pointer. So uh, here we can see where our NOPs start. The NOPs start here, meaning that somewhere here is the address that we want to jump to. Uh, we set the address that we want to jump to uh, at the very end end here of the command. Here's the address. So we will now see if this is a reasonable address. Uh, if cc90, because it's backwards here, it's the end unit of it, meaning that it's, that just means it's backwards on PCs. Uh, someone decided that long ago. <laughs> we just had to live with it. And here is where we see the nap stop in. Here is where the code starts. So here, here our code starts and the address CC something is not in here, right? That means it won't run our code. We will have to put a new one. So we can decide anything here. The only thing that we need to know about this address that we decide on here in the middle of the knobs is that it is not supposed to include the numbers that are not allowed and we checked these a bit earlier. So we know that, let's scroll up quite a bit. Uh, these numbers are not allowed to be in the address or in the payload because this will break the string and it won't work. So uh, here, now we can see zero, zero is not in any of these, right? Here we have a zero, zero. We couldn't start with this one. And then we have zero, nine, so no zero nines here, no problems. Uh, zero A, no zero A's, not a problem. Two zero, no two zeros. We could we could like take anything except for this. Are one. they like reserved keywords slash chars or something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's go even further up the notes here. So these characters they mean something, of course. That's why they're here. And I made a list here. So. Uh, a string in C is usually terminated, or it's always terminated, by a null character. So if you have a null character in the middle of the string, it will just stop reading there, right? 
So so we'll never never get any further. Then there's like for for this one we tested and saw what characters were replaced by a null actually because that's what happened. So a zero eight I think it was <laughs> I don't remember them down here. <laughs> So let's let's copy the bad cars. Come on, I'm blind. There. So let's copy these. So all of these characters were replaced by a null, zero zero. Null byte. Here. So if we paste these here, uh, let's keep it here as an example. So. 09, a horizontal tab also broke this and was replaced with a null in the string in that when we looked at the memory. And 0a is line feed, new line. So the new line was also seen as the end here of this. And also 20, which is space. So you couldn't have spaces in there either. So all of these broke, broke it. Otherwise, all characters were just sent in. Uh, into the string so we could just see it in memory was still there as it should be um so that's that's that is it clear any more questions um yeah and this was a suggestion okay a i understand thank you tester. great great so that's why we need to make sure that these numbers as we're sending this into there as in, in the string, you know, in the input string, we need to see that this character is not in there. So let's let's take another address. This one doesn't contain any of them. Uh, and then we need to know that D6 and E8, also the FFs, but the FFs are the same as before. Uh, we need to switch them around. So if I go back down here and we'll look at uh, what we sent. We sent like backwards now, FF, FF, CC. And now we want this to be D6 instead. So we do D6. And the last one was supposed to be E8 now. So here, right? D6, E8. And now we have E8, D6, FF. So that's just a PC thing. You have to just remember it. Uh, called endianess. So that's all. Now we have a new memory address, and this was the new one, right? <laughs> I'm like, I better check. What did I send last? Mm -hmm. Nah, I'm not going to check it. We still, we're still listening on on this uh, HTTP machine, on the same one we're sending stuff. So I'm just typing anything to hop to the end. Uh, let's do Q. Uh, we have seen where in memory this is. It looks okay. So now we go back to, to the command here. And now we're going to change these sixes here. Right? Uh, so uh, we, can, we can do this manually. It's so, so tiny bit. Things to change. I could have arrowed up one more time though. We have the FS there. <laughs> uh, so D6. And I missed, uh, removed the x too. So backslash x just means this is a hex value, these digits. And e8, uh, every hex digit is uh, four bits. That's why you have four plus four. So hex, two hex digit is eight bits. So that's why we have two of them for every character. So every character of five, Five bits, eight bits, right? <laughs> so too many numbers in my head now, right? So there we go. And uh, we want to restart the program. And we do have a breakpoint here, but it died before this. So what happened? This is interesting. Uh, I'm actually just going to quit this. 
I want to quit this. Yeah, so we'll do it all again. <laughs> and I'm curious to see if it has a new memory address. That's one of the reasons I restarting. I'm restarting it. So we're running it again. Now we can't arrow up. We'll have to type. Um, so if it, I'm like, didn't I do? I did a break, right? No, I didn't. Yeah, I forgot to, but it worked anyway. Because we still had it in memory. So sometimes it doesn't want to, after the program exits, it was, doesn't want to do it. Yeah, but that's when it doesn't break. When it's segmentation false, it still has it available for us. Right. So before I had it actually quitting in a good way, uh, actually not getting buffer overflow because of these break characters ending the string, making it shorter than it was supposed to be. And then I had to do break, make the break point because, uh, because of the bad characters ending the string, terminating it too early. So, <coughs> so now we can just run it and we can, we can test stuff. And I'm going to use this last one because I think it's correct. <laughs> but I'm not sure, so we'll see. Uh, I don't want to copy paste more than I have to. So to run, ah, it's just slow. I didn't do anything now. I just was, I just clicked it once and then it popped up. Not pasting. So confirming here, we have first character 55 a lot of times uh, so the number of characters we want to hop into before we type the address then we have 256 because we have 256 uh, nops nop is uh, no operation and it's hex 90 and then we have the actual instruction that we want run and then we have the, hopefully the address to these in, in the middle of the knobs. So it will just do no instructions until it ends up in the instructions we want run. So that's that. If it works, we did copy the right code. Otherwise I'll have to try again. Um, ooh. So looky looky so this is a new message this is what we were going for so apparently i run the same thing after we already have something run and it didn't work but when i started it again it worked so i have to look at memory later and this process didn't ex it didn't stop it's still running meaning we have this so if we do id here, we should be wrote. No, we're not. So it is still something off here. This is interesting because it's supposed to be sued and the program is supposed to run this. Bin dash. This feels so odd. Yeah, so I know that this should work, really. Um, so if we do ls here, we now have a connection at least, right? So if we were to cat the root thing, we can't do it, right? Because we're not a root. So I think it was flag duct txt and it will say permission denied because we don't have access because we're not root so this is all logical the problem is that we're supposed to get root uh, come on let's let's try again so 
uh, let's look at memory now. Uh, it exited with code 1. I'm kind of assuming that the memory check command that we used before this here, that this won't work now. But we will test it to see if it works. If it works, this is not logical because it's exited. Yeah, so now it says no registers. So ESP doesn't exist, it's not running. So if I had happened to know the address, which we might happen to know, we might just be able to do it anyway. Let's say that we do this instead, right? We have the address that this comes down to. So let's see if it <laughs> if it's the same. So I'm I'm interested in why it run that. So let's do X. Uh, we want to see hex. We want to see two thousand hex. We want to see it in hex byte format, one byte separate. Uh, and the address we want to see is. Yeah, it managed. It's so slow. So I think, what did it fail? Uh, and it cannot access this memory, which is kind of logical. So we'll have to restart it uh, with the breakpoint this time because it exited as it's supposed to. Uh, so I have to remember how to make a breakpoint. And break function name. Yeah. I almost remember that much, but what's on earth was the function name? I just checked it before here. Um, so right, uh, on on basic information, to get in for functions, we list all the functions and their addresses. So the function like names are just pointers to these addresses. So when we want to disassemble the when we disassemble main, then we really disassemble whatever is on this address. But it seems to be able to do it like it's a, it's a bit tricky because I managed to make it disassemble. That was R two though, and this machine doesn't have R two I think. Um, but I managed to get it to disassemble things that were not actually code, just bytes. So am I blind? Where is it? The function? I think it's like the same name as... Mm. Something that's not at PLT and is not start. Here, <laughs> it's just just before main, I'm so blind. So leave leave message. Very very hard to remember. I think the program name is leave underscore message though, so it's a bit it's a bit tricky, right? Uh, leave message not defined. So this is funny to me. Why? Let's see. Say yes. And let's try again. And let, let's just double check. It didn't have... Uh, I still want to do R2 now. I feel it's much better. Uh, so I could find mine, right? Let's look at main. And it doesn't have any other name. Because in, in R2 we would have another name, we would have like dot. So and it should already be loaded, right? And this is a run command. And this is the last memory address. Um, we could just do, I'm just arrowing up. We don't have more in this memory. This is good enough. So. <laughs> yeah, look. So I would like to look at memory before. 
This is so nice to see a lot of random stuff happening. <laughs> yeah, so how do I find the memory address before actually running it? I have to like break it main. Panda Tongue says, Let's break me. Where's your harness at when you're climbing through code? <laughs> Hi, Panda. Hope you're great. So, uh, let's break main instead. Let's actually. I'm going to quit. And then we run it again. So we have a fresh slate to start at. And instead of like doing anything else we will just i think break main we can do we don't like that break point and then when we run it with our the count arrow up because it's gone thingy let's copy just copying from the other screen here so we have this up still uh yeah you saw me testing that yesterday <laughs> Uh, I should have like tested a bit before. So really these addresses, um, this is not a correct address at this point, right? We don't know the address anymore or yet. So we will have to get a new one. There. So we're at our breakpoint. Now we can look at memory and have a bit more control there. Actually, I'm going to copy the memory command to the other screen so I can just easily paste it whenever I need it from there. So here, paste. And we can see our, our end of the quite a few 55s, the start of the, the knobs here that are supposed to be 256. And if we click again, we get the code uh, starting actually here. So to do this the same run again, we would use one of these addresses without contain that doesn't contain the bad cars and we should be listening here again then so we did get it working once but we were not rude so it's a bit odd actually it feels like it's just jumping around in memory without my control that's not a good feeling. So uh, here, here's where the actual exploit is. And it's MSF Venom. And we have copied their command to create it. Uh, then we have, uh, let's see, how many... Yeah, I was looking for the 66 or 66. It's hex 66, so it's not 66. 66 implies it's decimal numbers, which it's not. Uh, so after this, this bit of memory, this, we don't know what it is, whatever, you know, it's outside what, what we've been playing with. So we put all the way down here. This is what we put in memory. So now when we run this again, uh, so we had, uh, D6, uh, E8. Uh, should have been a knob. So D6, E8 should have been here in the knobs. Uh, we didn't run it though, right? So if we quit this one and now we like, let's clear the brakes, right? to check what how do I do that so uh, maybe I don't know how to do that in here 
Uh, so let's, we don't have to, we can just continue when we get there. Uh, C to continue, just continues normal execution from the breakpoint. So if we go back up and we replace this with our memory address, so FFFF, FFFFF, and then we have uh, one of these. Let's do D6B4 this timeline. Very similar. So it's slow. Uh, D6 B4, right? D6 B4, confirming. D6 B4 is in the middle of the knobs. We have them both R24. And we run this. And we want to start it from the beginning. Now we're at the breakpoint. So let's actually look at memory now again and confirm that D6B4 is still in the knobs. So D6B4 uh, there is still in the knobs, right? Uh, so we don't have to see it more. Now we press C for continue. So continue execution and uh, uh, error resetting breakpoint. Function main is not defined. Okay. Uh, we got our connection. Let's do ID. And we're still the HTTP student. So this is like just nothing inside my control. Uh, because I think that the program itself is supposed to use the the SUID, the, the permission changing. And when we disassembled it before, I think we saw that using it, right? The functions. Uh, let's scroll up to the functions. I don't know if I showed all of them. Sorry for the long scroll. Oh, we're actually here. No, that's the disassembling. So let's see here. I think I saw something. We should go to the disassembled instead. This is not useful. Set result ID print of close recovery puts exit. Let's look at the, the code. So, um, yeah, set. I think this is what's supposed to do it. Uh, so let's actually copy this and Google it because I'm curious now. Um, So, um, set real effective or saved user or group ID. Uh, and this is done here in the code before, before the call to, to the leave message. So we don't have to understand all of the details of everything here to, to see that this looks like it should work, right? We could step through it, look at all of the code. I don't want to look at the code for this. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like curious if something is wrong with this. Hmm? Also, what, what does it want? It wants the, the contents of a flag file. Yeah. So it might be broken. It might be broken. 
Uh, it's not like it's the first time that happened, right? So, um, an unprivileged process may change its real UID, effective UID, and save set user ID uh, each to one of the current real UID, the current effective UID, or the current saved set user ID. A privileged process. Uh, cap set UID. Uh, capability. Uh, and this is a real CU, it is not. Uh, Set your capability. <sighs> Regardless of the changes. So I think this is what's supposed to give us the permissions that we don't have. So since the connection works, you know, it's not like I can rewrite the program because we're not, we don't have high permissions on this. So, uh, let's quickly see, so hack the box, see if anyone else had problems, and it's a uh, buffer, overflow, and uh, uh, Let's actually copy the ID string because if someone else had problems, they probably wrote this right. I got this instead of root. So this is from the forums. Is this the same one? Uh, I'm getting a shell. HB student, please help. Finally, <laughs> so they they continued. They got this first, and then they got this. So they they managed it. Uh, I also got stuck on this. Uh, I followed all the stuff that was taught in the journal. I have been reading and watching. Uh, Uh, did you get a reverse shell? How was this reverse shell? What user are loading us? You know how sticky bits work, right? Find the file with a sticky bit set. Okay, okay. Okay. Is this for exactly the same? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mori. That's great. I'll give a 14 Maliki when you Translated from Indonesian. <laughs> okay, so you're speaking Indonesian and that's English? <sighs> I guess I'll just have to think more. The thing is that we had like a very similar thing, but not the same, right? So they expect us to think. I didn't think they expect us to think. <laughs> Uh, find the file with a sticky bit set. Remember when you're inside GDB and run the same as executing the script with the parameter as follows. So let's see what the next one says. You can only debug a set you and set it program. If the debugger is running as root, the kernel won't let you call 
IP trace on a program running with extra privilege as if it did, you would be able to make a program execute anything with your efficient mode. Uh, Okay, okay. Alright, so we're not actually supposed to run it in there. Yeah, I think since... Didn't it change its memory address today? Just now? Every time I restart GDB. So how would I then do it? Ah, this is just a general question. So 124 is just a random number, but it's a bit messy. We could just have all of these be knobs. We don't really have to have any 55s. Uh, I think we are no... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're already in the machine. So I, I think I remember that there were no other files there, but maybe I should look at the directory. Uh, right. Yeah, so I... Since I had this problem last time and I didn't remember the thing at all, really, well, I remember bits. Uh, I I did before leaving work. While I was working, I checked the the end of a YouTube video on this, and they did exactly what I did. And the only difference from what they did, what I did, that they did it on the machine, and I did it to my machine, right? And uh, we do have a connection now on the machine. And they was they were root, so that's how this started at least. Maybe it's not that like that anymore. Uh, but let's see if there's anything interesting here. Uh, multiple ways, including this, leave a message. What? Why would they do that? So the person who didn't find it found it finally. Someone probably said congrats or something. Or give me a hint, <laughs> of course. Uh, yes, I guess we should just see it as a normal box. Yeah. <laughs> Think outside the shell, not out of outside the box or anything. Outside the shell. <laughs> okay. 
So my problem with this is that uh, it changes memory addresses. So when I close, uh, when I close it down, it changed the addresses. Um, so we're still connected to the machine. Hmm, I guess uh, so I didn't really look at that video very closely. I just know that they used Netcat to catch it So they used the thing right they didn't do something completely different uh, So if we Ellis lay here just to make sure I didn't forget we, we just have these files right uh, and leave messages on by root so This is what we're running to get this shell and test you it. Um, and I thought from reading the, maybe I shouldn't have disassembled it. Maybe that's just confusing. So let's just listen again and just run it outside of GDB with the same command and see what happens, right? So let's just copy this here. So, and Actually, yeah, I guess I'm quitting this. Again, and then we're Alice Lane because what was the name? <laughs> so, leave message, paste, and we're running this outside of GDB with the same memory address. So I don't think it even run it, did it? Okay. So this is, this is surprises me because it changed the memory address, right? And now it worked. So now we have root there. So meaning we can read the file. So I have to go up and look. So, okay, so Suid, what, what they said really in the text, what I read in this, they said, uh, you can never use a Suid within uh, GDB. That's what they said, because then you would have problems, right? But let's see here, memory address, let's look here. So here we're at, yeah, so we're at D6 already. So it's when we, res when we reset the box, that's when we get a new memory address. So as long as we're in the same session, D6 and D6. So, as long as we're in the same session on this specific HB machine, we have the same address. Even if we run it, even if we restart GDB, if we run it in GDB and outside, because I have a different experiences when running this. So, but the GDB thing is a big thing to note down. And I'll have to reread this, what they wrote. And I have so much training ache. It's crazy. Oh, I hardly can work today. Oh, and also, I am I usually can bend my arms more like this. It's... Ah. So the indoors climbing was really good training for me. Move to big stretch. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't stretch a thing today. <laughs> So let's just cut the thing so we have that done first. Uh, flag.txt. Um, so I'm going to copy this. But I want to know more. I want to check this out. We want to make sure that we have this in our notes. So let's go to the... Let's close this one. Uh, so let's let's paste here. Uh, 
Um, yeah. So why why should these stay forever? So before we continue, uh, we I guess we could click finish. Um, because it doesn't have to anything to do with the room. Uh, we want to do the Windows one next, but first I need to know. Uh, details, uh, GDB. Uh, GDB, set you it. No, just to it. Suid program. So, <clears throat> oh, so annoying. Uh, just because it's Unix stack exchange code, you have to do that again. <laughs> When I did show uh, execute the yeah, open shell, GDB. Now we're gonna do a GDB. It starts the process as normal user. Yeah, and launches a user shell. So this is the whole thing that we're exploring now. So, um, uh, you can only debug a set, uh, set UID or set it program if a debugger is running as root. The kernel won't let you call ptrace. This is exactly the same text. <laughs> on our program running with extra privileges. If it did, you would be able to make the program execute anything, which would effectively mean you could if you run a root shell by calling a debugger on bin su. Right, because su has su it set. So there's other stuff required to actually use the su it. Uh, if you run GDB as root, you'll be able to run your program, but you will only be observing its behavior when run by root. Uh, if you need to debug a program when it's not started by a root, start the program outside GDB. Uh, make it pause in some fashion before getting to the troubleshooting and attach the process inside GDB. So, we need to test stuff. Uh, I have to take a short break. Um, so we we solved the problem, we know the reason, um, but we don't know why it didn't work. <laughs> well, I guess it's the, just this this box, Nix buff 32 skills that can't connect to another machine using this. It might work now though, we could try again. We'll just make sure we have notes on this. Uh, and try maybe the attach, and uh, let's look, let's just quickly check the time. But I just have to go to pee. What happened? So when I finish it, did it stop the box? No, it's still up, and we have forty-one minutes, so I can go and pee. <laughs> uh, I have to get some pancakes for my kid too. Yeah, I, I will actually uh, one one thing at a time. Just get pictures of it in the lab box, yeah. Oh, pizza time. No. Oh, you can be me and Walt with that. You have to be with that.
So seriously, this training ache, like pulling, like pulling your pants off, <laughs> what's, what's the worst part of, you know, climbing like this. So there's also like training ache on the outside edge of my hair, actually around on the top. I'm like, not, apparently not very used to muscles. I also have a tiny bit in my breast muscles, but that's like muscles you use, right? <laughs> uh, I'm just going to switch Mike and I'll go and get some pancakes for him then we'll explore this and we go Windows buffer overflow uh, so
Wupinion says. Hi Nori. No sound fix it. So, my this mic must have disconnected then. So, that's odd. Fix it it. Fix it says. Test. Opinion says. Name checks out. <laughs> yeah, but I hope to fix more things than that. Yeah, so so I'm thinking uh sense uh there needs to be a way to pause uh, a process uh, to be able to attach to it and put it connected to GDB. And this program is simple and it just takes input and then it crashes if it doesn't get input. So there's no way to pause it. And the input is the only thing that's happening. <laughs> uh, Come on, line input. So I don't think there's any way to pause it. So I think we'll have to survive not testing it and just adding this to our knowledge base that this is how it works. And um, uh, let's go to the notes here. And I have added it here. Attach process ID. And here, let's, let's fix this. Um, so this is important. Uh, but I want BRs here. So, uh, let's actually do all the lines, I guess. So, uh, you can only debug a situate or a setted program if the debugger is running as root. Otherwise, you could just call GDB. Uh, for yeah, I think for is the best alternative, and have root on yeah on. Let's do on. Come on. So apparently I couldn't edit it in that mode. So f the font tag makes it not as editable. <laughs> Uh, if you run uh, GDB as root, you will be able to run your program, but you'll only be observing its behavior when run by root. If you need to debug the program when it's not started by root, start the program. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't get the source for this really. We want, we want to have our sources because I don't want to steal people's stuff. You know, that's mostly why. It's not like I care about sources like that. Good information is good information. Um, recently closed tabs. I think it's this one. No, 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 no. Uh, history. Is this the one? Yeah, Unix. So. Let's just do from. So there. Mm. I edited the tiny bit here to get rid of some text, but I think it's all interesting anyway uh, or we could just we could just skip two lines at least it's it's still too much stuff here mm. so it's simply So, we don't have to read this if we're not checking this, right? Mm. 
Uh, actually, I it's supposed to be SG. <sighs> ID. Set user ID. Set group ID. So yeah, I think I'm good with this one. It's okay. It's okie dokie. So oh, right. I have to click finish again because <laughs> I overwrote the history where we ended up in this room. So what happens with continue here? But I've done this. I don't get it. So what's dashboard? Uh-huh. But this one has a continue too. So why does this one has a con have a continue? Is it because of this one is not checked? To me it looks completed. Oh, so I did not click that button. So now it has a view instead of continue as this one. So now we want to do stack based buffer overflows on Windows. And then we have to unlock this. I don't know why this one is here. I don't know how to remove it. If I click it, can I remove it then? Oh, it's a part of this thing here. So I did not want to enroll into this, really. So what, can I go back to the dashboard there? No, this is not what I wanted either. But it says that this is completed now. So let's just search for buffer overflow windows. I don't have a uh, hundred and sixty of these. These are the free ones. Stack based buffer flow on windows. So, if I put Windows in here, it didn't find it. I did click. So, so we're in the Windows one now. Yeah, and this is why I had clicked this to test, see what happens. I thought it would say, you don't have this money, but it didn't. It just popped it in there. Uh, so if I unlock this now, and it asks me, do you want to unlock for 10? We have unlocked it for 10. And then I think we will get those 10 back when we finish it. So it's free. So I guess I will read this. <clears throat> Windows binary exploitation has advanced through the years from basic stack overflow techniques to advanced security bypass techniques and heap exploitation. To reach a level of understanding that enables us to successfully exploit even the most advanced application, we must have a firm grasp of the fundamentals of Windows binary exploitation, which is the main aim of this module. Uh, it's the first step on Windows binary exploitation. It will take you through the following. What is binary exploitation and buffer overflows? How to debug a Windows programs? Basics uh, of local and remote fuzzing of Windows programs. Finding and using return instruction to subvert the program execution flow. Uh, okay, message. Multinational with... conscription says. Cheap viewers on. Web link. Yeah, I, I wish says. I could make the message yes, removed. Read it. Oh, 
I'll talk to the security guard and see. Uh, crafting malicious payloads and scripts to gain local and remote control through buffer overflow vulnerabilities. Uh, developing a functional multi-tier Python exploit for stack-based buffer overflows, which can be used as a basis for other buffer overflow exercises. Throughout the module, we'll be uh, attacking two different programs. First, we generate a malicious wave file that exploits a buffer overflow vulnerability in an audio converter to perform local privilege isolation. Then, we'll move uh, to a remote isolation by attacking a remote server to gain remote code execution over it. After debugging the vulnerable uh, binary uh, locally and developing an exploit. In addition to teaching the above topics, this module will also cover a short history of stack-based buffer overflows. Uh, a real-world example of this vulnerability is the process behind developing a stack-based buffer overflow, fussing the program's fields and parameters, identifying the exact offset of our input's location within the buffer, uh, controlling the address of the return instruction. It's like the same stuff, of course. Identifying now, eliminating potentially bad characters, learning multiple methods of finding and utilizing return instruction to subvert execution flow, generating shortcuts and executing them uh, through the return instructions, uh, fussing listing, listening port uh, gradually to identify the length of our buffer precisely, adapting our local exploit to attack remote ports. I don't know what this means. Crest CPS ACRT related. Ah, uh, whatever. Uh, this module is broken down into sections. Yeah, so. Let's, let's just continue. Uh, so. They suggest us doing intro to assembly first, and I'm not going to, but I might later. If it's very intro, maybe it's not interesting. But if it is not, how would you know? Is it free? That's the only thing I care about. I don't want to pay stuff if it's... You kind of need to know stuff about what they are, right? So let's actually duplicate the tab. Um, I don't want to type if I don't have to. So if we paste this, it found it. So is this a free one? Here, how do I see this? It's the only way to click the actual button. It looks kind of basic, but like libc functions. Coding techniques? Yeah, why not? There's a YouTube here too. Uh, so what happens if I click here? Will it like automatically do anything? So this is 40. Yeah. No, no, it's 100 even. We have 40 too little. So that's a no. So... I don't understand this way, you know, if it was like a subscription and you could just access anything, then I, I would pay for it. I would probably get them more money than I, that I don't want to give them from buying stuff like that. I don't know if it's good, you know. If I click something, find it's bad, and I have paid specifically for that, then it's like money thrown away. Uh, if there's a subscription and parts of it is good and parts bad and I can just click and see whatever, you know? Then it's more free and I can decide what I want to do myself. Um, so, just checking time. And I need to eat something later. When should I eat? <sighs> Oh, 
Well, I'm thinking I'll save time if I eat. Um, I'll, I'll probably just... My kid uh, took for, for a break was actually this Thai cube. A uh, frozen Thai cube. And I'm like very... I was like... Mmm. <laughs> so I want to want you. So I was thinking dinner. It's a bit too early. But I'm leaving for training at 18. So... Yeah. Maybe one and a half hour or something. Uh, buffer overflows. Stack based buffer overflows on Windows x86. Uh, let's actually do a mark of you. Two hours. Oh my. Ah, uh, you'd think I'm really tired. I'm not. I'm not tired at all. Uh, buffer overflow. Binary isolation is among the most essential skills for any penetration test. It's usually the way to find the most advanced vulnerabilities in programs and operating system and requires a lot of skill. Over the years, many protections have been added to the way memory is handled by the OS kernel and how binaries are compiled to prevent such vulnerabilities. Still, there are always newer ways to exploit minor mistakes found in binaries and utilize them to gain control over a remote machine or gain higher privilege over a local machine. As binary memory protections become more advanced, however, so do binary exploitation methods. This is why modern binary exploitation methods require a deep understanding of assembly language, computer architecture, and fundamentals of binary exploitation. Both assembly language and computer architecture were thoroughly covered in uh, Internet Assembly Language module and the stack based buffer overflow on Linux module. <coughs> also cover the basic of binary exploitation on Linux. Yeah, so we haven't done this one. It's, it costs money. This one was free and we just finished it, so. Uh, buffer overflows in binary exploitation. But our primary goal is to survive the binary execution in a way that benefits us. Buffer overflows are the most common type of binary exploitation, but other types of binary exploitation exist, such as format string exploitation or heap exploitation. So these are links to wiki and OWASP. So let's open them, but not read them now. A buffer overflow occurs when a program receives data that's longer than expected, such as it overwrites the entire memory space on the stack. So stack, I guess, is also wiki. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this can overwrite the next instruction pointer. Next. Well, actually, the old, <laughs> I would say. Uh, or RIP. EIP or RIP. Uh, so... 32-bit name, 64-bit name, uh, which causes a program to crash because it will attempt to execute instructions at an invalid memory address by forcing the program to crash. This is the most basic example of exploiting buffer overflows, known as the Nile service DOS attack. Uh, another basic attack. Oh my! <sighs> is to override a value on the stack to change the program's behavior. For example, if an exam program has a buffer overflow vulnerability, you can overwrite the buffer enough to overwrite our score. Since our exam score is stored in the stack, in this example, we can take advantage of this flaw and change our score. If we are a bit more sophisticated, we can change the address of the IP to an instruction that will execute our shell code, uh, as we just did for Linux. This would allow us to execute any command that was, uh, we want instead of just crashing the program, known as jumping to shell code. Okay, uh, with more advanced memory protections, it uh, may not be possible to load our entire shell code and point to it. Instead, we may use a combination of instructions from the binary to execute a particular function and overwrite various pointers to change the program execution flow. This is known as return-oriented programming. 
rock attacks. Finally, modern programming and modern programs and operating systems may use a heap instead of a stack to store buffer memory, which will require heap overflows or heap exploitation methods. And hopefully we have uh, more information on that here. Um, so where were I? Okay, so this was all of that. Stack overflow. Let's start by demonstrating how stack works in storing data. The stack has a last in, first out for this side, which means that we only pop out the last element pushed into the stack. We can push an element into the stack, it will be located on top of the stack. If we pop anything from the stack, the item located at the top of the stack would get popped. The following table demonstrates how the stack works. Uh, we can click on push to save a value from the X to the stack and pop to pop uh, the value, the top value from the stack into the AX. So, oh. so why do we have empty? Because they want to show us and fill stuff up. So we've just been doing this a lot. I'm thinking, should we hop stuff? I guess I'll just read it quickly, right? Oh, we can actually, <laughs> we can actually use it. So. Let's uh, push one, two, three onto the stack. Let's push four, five, six onto the stack. And then we pop and pop and pop and pop and have nothing left. We better put something on the poor stack. <laughs> uh, this is nice to have actual running examples, right? Uh, <laughs> this is like baby level, or is it? Uh, the above example correctly receives buffer data, such as it uh, never gets overflowed to the next part. I should probably read more carefully. The above example correctly receives buffer data, such that it never gets overflowed. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we, if we write a mega long one here, Okay. It it always pops on to the top. So what if we like fill it all up? What will happen then? Yeah, I can't I can't do anymore. I was I was I did have to try, you know. Uh, the following example explains. Uh, Example expects an input from us in eight characters long. But what would happen if you send a longer? Try to send twenty characters. So okay. And there push. So uh, as we can see. Uh, when we send a string that is longer than expected, it overrides other existing values on the stack. I would even overwrite the entire stack if it was long enough. Though the problem with this is, uh, let's let's reset it and let's do a long one again. Um, so okay, so it did it the right way. Good, good, yeah. So it it was good. I hoped so. But I, in my corner of my eye, I didn't really look carefully enough, apparently. I didn't seem like it did it, but it did. Uh, <clears throat> Most importantly, we see that... Cybernair it, it Dante overwrote. says... Hello, hello. Hello. Happy Tuesday. The same to you. Happy Tuesday. Hope you're having a great day. And that you're great. Uh, in great shape. Oh. So let's continue reading. So this is repetition since we just did the Linux one. So we're doing Windows now. Windows. Ah. Oh. Oh. 
does not, uh, let's see, most importantly, uh, we see that it overwrote the value at EAP. Uh, and when the function tries to return to this address, the program will crash since the address does not exist in memory. This happens because the lethal descent of the stack, which grows upwards, while a long string overflows values downwards until it eventually overwrites the return address EAP <coughs> and the bottom of the stack pointer EBP here. Uh, this was explained in introduce on the language. Okay, so this was a paid module, so we want to look at that. Uh, if no one tells me it's great, <laughs> if someone does that, I might. Uh, whenever a function is called, a new stack frame is created and the old EAP. Uh, so I have my own text on this already. Gets pushed to the stop of the new stack frame so the program knows where to return uh, once the function is finished. For example, if our buffer input overrides the entire stack and return address EAP. I am thinking, is this better than my explanation? Then I might update mine. I don't think so. It, it's an example though. Example is always good. <clears throat> so, um, if our buffer input overrides the entire stack and return address EAP, then the overridden EAP address will be called when the function returns to you to a write instruction. I think mine's better. Uh, if the, we calculate our input precisely, we can place a valid address in the location where EAP is stored. This will lead the program to go to our overridden address and uh, when it returns, and start the program execution. So let's just hop over here to buffer overflow. And I'm thinking that I'll need to edit the end of this, right? But here's, here's really, I think this is better, but I also have text explanations, but I'm not opening all of them, am I? Come on. So, was there something else minimized here? I'm just trying to find the header, there it is. VR oh. Mechatronics says. Web link. There. Look, this is rain water. Sure, okay. So let's look at rainwater. Oh my god, sorry people, have I been zoomed in? That was not on purpose. I had to change. It was when I was typing all the numbers, right? Oh gosh. Yeah. A lot of rain. Lots of rain. <laughs> I think they s forgot to stop filming. Yeah, so the other day when it rained a week ago, too, uh, when it was out in the rain, then it, while I was just, just a few minutes, the water increased like. 20 centimeters on top of the bridge that was already overflowing when I went one direction. So it, it started really raining in southern that Poland. Day. Yeah, that looks looks bad. So here we didn't have anything that bad at least, but it was raining a lot. So weather is a bit out of control, not really. Yeah. Uh, let's let's continue reading. I want to focus and get some some studying done. Uh, this would lead the program to go to a written address. Yeah, I read that. Real world examples. There have been numerous uh, incidents where stack overflow exploits were used to bre break into restricted systems like mobile phones and gaming consoles. 
In 2010, iPhones running iOS 4 were jailbroken using the green poison jailbreak, which utilized two different exploits to gain kernel level access over the iPhone and install an official Unsense software and apps. One of these exploits has been uh, was a stack based buffer overflow on the iPhone's HFS volume name. Ooh. Uh, at that time, Apple did not automatically randomize address space. Uh, iOS 4.3 patches vulnerabilities and introduced memory uh, protections like randomizing address space, address space layout randomization, ASLR, stack based overflow exploit, uh, who also used a high gain kernel level access on the original PlayStation Portable PSP. Uh, so that's too new for me to know anything about it. <laughs> the original, I was like, original? Are there several versions? <laughs> This allowed uh, the use of pirated games as well as installing unsigned software. The TIFF exploit exploits a vulnerability around the TIFF image library in the PSP's photo viewer. This uh, leads to code execution by simple viewing malicious TIFF file in the photo viewer and setting the background to a corrupt PNG image. Mm. Another similar attack. Uh, Stack or Floyd's part was later discovered in a PSP game, uh, Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, uh, which had a overflow vulnerability in its saved game data that can be exploited by loading a malicious load file. So, how many examples do they have? Okay, there's one in Zelda uh, and PlayStation 2, free DVD boot. Yeah, so we don't have to read all of this. My god. Someone like games who wrote this. <laughs> all, all console examples. Of course, operators like Windows, Linux, and Mac OS were always the first target for stack based but for all flow exploits. There have been numerous inv such vulnerabilities found uh, in all of these uh, systems and software running by them. By detecting these vulnerabilities before products go to production, we will reduce the occurrence of potentially catastrophic pitfalls. Stack overflow protections. Yeah, so let's go to that in our notes. <coughs> so I, what I would like to have uh, here, let's see if I can just open all of these without messing up. This is not closed, okay? Now, I would like to have like headers on this side, and we might actually make such an add on to Obsidian if no one else does because I want it. I want to be able to see underneath my buffer overflow where is it? Not Linux here. So, under buffer overflow here, I would like to see the headers. In uh, like in Google Docs, you can see the headers, you know, on the side. I would like to be able to see that, so that I wouldn't have to go like, a, "What is buffer overflow?" Uh, Reddish memory layout stack stack frames. Where did I put these nodes? Program flow in assembler. Did I put it in a separate file? Yeah, it's in modern security features. So this is why I didn't find it. But still, I would like this function to have, have that. Kitty says. Buffer overflow is easy to understand in the speedrunning game world. <laughs> okay. So, how do you use buffer overflow in speedrunning games? Oh, I should drink this because I'm hungry. <clears throat> so apparently we had 
water overflow. So buffers in all kinds of things, including real world. Ah, so these are the notes so far on this. I'm disabling security features for testing there. Um, right, so did I have the compiler ones there too? Yeah, they're here. Compiling away and then disabling for testing. Right. So let's read this. Uh, as we may notice from the above examples, uh, most of them are pretty old, aging back at least a decade. This is because modern operating systems have many protections for the stack, like preventing code execution or randomly changing the memory addresses. These protections make it uh, so we can easily run our code placed on the stack or pre-calculate the memory addresses to jump to. However, even with these protections, uh, if a program is vulnerable to a buffer overflow, there are advanced methods to If you wish to be interested how buffer overflow works in games, web link. Okay, sure, I, I can I can watch later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that looks like something my kids would <laughs> like. Um, I'll look later. Thanks, Nori. Um, even though I didn't have any snacks. Yeah, so um, hard to pre-calculate memory that is to jump to. However, even with these type of predictions, if a program is vulnerable to buffer overflow, there are advanced methods. I had to snacks before I came because I knew you did not have any for me, Noiki. <laughs> one cry. Yeah, I'm trying to be healthy. I don't have any snacks. If I had snacks, I wouldn't be healthy. That's like a very clear thing, right? <laughs> Some examples include the previously mentioned uh, return oriented programming wrap. Our Windows specific execution methods like egg hunting or structured exception handling say exploitation. Right, so uh, so there's not any more information about this, right? Uh, so advanced bypass methods. We need to have this in our notes. And we don't yet, so we have to fix it. So, uh, so I copy stuff and then I type it. That's not smart. I can just at least use one of the words. Uh, So Windows specific. All right, I should have hopped an extra there. So both of these are Windows specific. So let's see what level header should we use. Three. And uh, to add, because we don't have enough information, this is just, we need to add stuff, right? Now I want snacks, Nori! <laughs> Can you get me some snacks, please? Digital are okay, they're okay. Uh, furthermore, modern compilers prevent the usage of functions that are vulnerable to stack overflows. I got some crackers and rice cakes only plain flavor. Oh. At least salt, right? Thanks. Um, so, the compilers themselves have a... Uh, 
safety features and these are what we're disabling here with uh, no stack protector and no uh, PIE and exec stack to be able to execute stuff from the stack so we had to do that to be able to run stuff so I guess it's good that there's it's secure now of course this right let's let's fun stuff to play with though but it's good for you don't want people to hack your computer right so <clears throat> Yeah, which signifies the occurrence of uh, reduces the occurrence of stack based overflows. This is why stack based overflows are less common these days. At the same time, other more advanced types of binary exploitation are more common as they can't be mitigated by simply enabling a protection method. We will learn basic stack overflows. <clears throat> in this module, we we'll learn how to. My God, to thirty. I've been thirty minutes on this page. <laughs> uh, in this module, we'll learn how to gain code execution through basic stack-based buffer overflows. We will do so on applications and systems that do not have any memory protection. Otherwise, uh, we require more advanced methods to gain code execution. But if basic stack based overflows are no longer common these days, why should you learn them? We do so because learning them gives us a good understanding of the basics of binary exploitation and the fundamentals of exploit development. Furthermore, once we master how to detect and exploit basic stack based buffer overflows, it will be much easier to learn structured exception handling, uh, which is very common in modern Windows. So, uh, I'm like, what? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, finally. Once we get a good grip on basic stack overflows and basic mitigation bypasses, we would be ready to start learning advanced mitigation bypass methods like ROP and other advanced binary exploitation methods. So, so what was on the right side here? Did I scroll past something? Just a list of what we're going to do, I guess. So, Ah, uh, there's a sheet sheet. I wonder if the, the other one had a sheet sheet. What if it happens if I click here? Oh, so it like hops up stuff from top. Okay, now I'm too curious to do anything else but to duplicate and go to the last one. So if we go to the dashboard, can we still see the old one? So this is in my favorite list. Um, so modules, all modules, here we can see all modules, I assume. So owned modules should probably be these three, right? And here I can see that these are finished. I can remove this. I can click this to look at it again. Right. So we're learning how the HTB Academy works. So there is no was it cheat sheet? No sheet sheet on this. So if we were to hop in the middle of it, there's go to questions. What's questions? Oh, of the page. Meaning this sheet sheet thing is for this page. So if we go back. We don't have a sheet sheet. We do have a sheet sheet. So it's all for for all pages. So 
Is it the same here and there? I have to explore. So we have Python ERC. That sounds interesting. Yeah. It's the same for all of them. So, uh, I guess we'll copy this. Our first steps, commands. And you can download it in what format? PDF. Oh, we prefer text. Text you can copy and paste. So, um, I'm as we can't, you know, have too long documents here. I'm thinking of splitting this one up. So let's just make a new note with uh, HTB buff windows sheet sheet there right so it's all here it copied okay so I'll just hop back here uh, but I really want to have that one up too because it's sound oh middle click not right click so let's have that up so we we won't have to go back to this page or something so this looks interesting So we already have uh, a new stuff. Uh, so where do I have tools? I guess you can find it by searching here. So I have VinGB G and Immunity Debugger that listed here. And they have Ida Pro. <laughs> uh, are either outdated or need a pro license to use. Okay, yeah, outdated. This is my problem with the with the Troy Hack Me room. And here they seem to have like, so we can't use it, it's too old. We'll see. Welcome in. Fixerbot Welcome says, in. thanks for the follow. New follower ST Forkham. Less than three. So, we just did li the Linux one. Now we're doing the Windows one. Uh, so I'll read this, and when we find interesting stuff, we'll put it in the notes too. Uh, debugging Windows programs to successfully identify and exploit buffer overflows in Windows programs. We need to debug the program to follow its execution flow and its data in memory. Now, there are many tools that we can use for debugging, like Immunity Debugger, uh, and this one that I didn't know. OliDBG, WinDBG, uh, also the links, right? Let's actually open. Uh, however, these debuggers are either outdated or need a pro license to use. And we got a f Immunity link didn't work very well. Is it too outdated? Yeah. <laughs> it was that outdated. <laughs> uh, maybe just a spelling mistake. I don't know. I probably have a link already. We could Google if we wanted to. In this module, we will be using X 
64 DVD. So, X64 DVD. So, it is at least X64. <laughs> Number source user mode debugger for Windows optimized for reverse engineering and malware analysis. And we don't know yet if it's UE, it is. And it has dark mode. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's better. And hopefully, you can set the size of the fonts. Right? I'm assuming if it's modern you have size for fonts, right? So let's actually look at this one first. I didn't look at this one. Okay, so 2014. So, and it's 32 bit. So we could just say bye bye to that page. Or should we add it as a old one? Uh, win GDP. So when I was a GDP's page, I read something about like there being planned. VR Megatronic says. Assassin's Creed One Two. Three are for two comma fifty euro on Steam. Okay, okay. Yeah, so my hobby plays those. I think. I I don't really take time to play games. I think this is more fun. <laughs> this is my games. Uh, sometimes I play mobile games, but I think it takes too much time from my life, so I just deleted them all again. Uh, I don't even have a card game. I j I do have a practice like. Languages app still, but that's learning. That's not the thing. <laughs> Cybernair Dante says, "Runescape is the best game ever." Okay, okay, yeah. So I do get all the free Epic games in case I would want them. You know, later and want to play something, uh, and I get them for my kids too, since they're free. You know. Uh, if they're not, if they're too bloody or anything, uh, but what I do have, VR I have says. Raft installed. And I don't play, but I Iron collect One. collections of games on promotions. <laughs> okay, you don't play the games, yeah. So I haven't really played games for some time, so uh, I'm just going to open up TTS and OBS again so I, they don't fall asleep, or rather, I want to see what screen I'm on, what I'm sharing. On OBS. Uh, so Ida Pro is paid, but there's a free version, right? But it's not useful. I, I read this as it's not as useful. If normal price is nineteen comma ninety nine, I grab minus ninety percent. Yeah, but it's a, it's not very economical if you ever never play the games. You know, if you don't play the games, then you just throw money to nothing, right? That's the thing. So, but if you're thinking like, oh, I'll probably want to play this game, but then if you haven't played it after 20 years, will you play it? <laughs> so it's all prioritization. Do you, do, you, do you prioritize playing games? Or do you prioritize like watching a Twitch stream maybe or? Well, maybe working on something or maybe studying something. But I can share it in the cloud with friends when they want to play. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then you're doing like a community service there buying the games for other people. <laughs> yeah. If you can share them as a family thing then. You put your friends in a family group on Steam. So I do that with my, my family. No one else. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You have to give them your password, right? <laughs> or log in on their computers as you, of course. <clears throat> so a pair of filters is similar. I never heard that I have a bugger. But what about the free? Let's see a comparison between free. Free. 
Binary tool. So, what's included? I have already bought 280 Debugger? games for 10% of their value. Oh my god. So, what is the price? What have you paid for those? For me, it's like... <laughs> Not worth it. It's all... Uh, what, do you, what do you like, you know? But, um... So we can analyze 32-bit and 64-bit applications. Um, it has local debuggers, cloud-based decompiler. I guess that it it's like not a server thing. I don't know what the difference is. Around one thousand euros. Yeah, that's some. That's a lot of money, really. For even if it's ten percent, right? Don't you think? Yeah. It all depends what you think is worth it. Anyway, uh, yeah, here's... I was thinking they must have a comparison. So, debuggers, local and remote. Uh, free, local. File format. Okay, so this can't take a lot of formats. That's a limitation. Oh, yeah. So that's the limitation, and it's mostly x86. Or only the compiler, it says. Yeah, and of course it's always better to use, you know, open source stuff, free stuff. Always better. But I'm curious what the difference is and why they didn't use this. Because I was curious, you know? Um, so I just put it as a, as a question mark here, but I thought this probably can be used. That's why I did it here, in a parenthesis. Um, for Windows there are... Uh, so let's actually fix this one here, but I'm going to read more first and then when we know what we like we can add this. But I also have this you can see with the Linux ones. I have stuff I don't use a lot in the list anyway. So I guess we should add Oli DVG. Yeah, so these are outdated. Um, I guess we'll add it here. So, it's there. I didn't type it the same way though. Uh, so... Let's just see. Yeah, I'll I'll read those later sometime. So this is what we will be using. X64 DBG. Of course we need this in our notes. Um, a modern choice. Question mark so far. And... Uh, I think that we do this. Uh, X64 DBG. Is that right? Yeah. <clears throat> so you can always Google if you don't have the link, so it doesn't matter really to put them there, but anyway. An excellent Windows debugger aims specifically at binary exploitation and reverse engineering. Open source tool developed and maintained by the community and also supports I'll send you a VR treadmill and a headset so you can play VR games on stream. <laughs> oh, yeah, do that. That would be cool. I don't know if that is a space, though. Yeah, if you could do that. But you have to build it first, right? 
So how how is your invention going, VR? You'll have to tell me. Give me an update. Uh, unlike immunity. Okay, so immunity only does 32 a bit. That's good to know. I have two prototypes already. Oh, Kitty cool. says. Ooh. Nor is I try to fix but... something in Unity for VR chat. So I open script to fix and I am greeted with. Header do not edit anything in here. Or you may make it worse. It's already broken, so how can I make it worse, Noiki? One you. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll fix it, Nori. But you two have both VR's big interest, right, Nori? You said you're always in VR chat. You you do a lot of stuff, and VR mechatronics is is building. Yeah, as you said there, a th VR treadmill, so you can actually like be in there and jump and all the things it said. It was sounds cool. <laughs> so you'll have to send it to Nora instead. VR mechatronics climbing, says. yeah, climbing. Yes, climbing. So. Cool. So. Uh, immunity debugger only does 32 bit, uh, so we can keep using uh, the DVD, x64 DVD, uh, when we want to move to Windows x64 buffer overflows. In addition to the debugger itself, we will utilize binary, uh, a binary explanation plugin to efficiently carry out many tasks required for identifying and exploiting buffer overflows. Yeah, one popular plugin is Mona Pi. So I think this was in the Immunity Debugger stuff we read too. Uh, which is an excellent binary exploitation plugin, though it's no longer maintained, does not support x64, and runs on Kitty says. 2. If I did more stuff in VR, I would be skeleton lol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you. But VR, have you checked out Nori streams? Let's do a shout out here. I don't think VR streams, but you do, Nori. So, uh, VR Mechatronics says, I need to find some escape room. I want to install it there. So, there, everybody. Nori does very cool v VR uh, DJ streams. Yeah? So go and listen to the music and look at the, all the cool graphics and the build like, yeah, cool disco rooms <laughs> and stuff. You can tell, you can tell, Nori. So there. Uh, yeah, so apparently Mona is ancient. Python 2. Uh, so instead we will be using ERC. Kitty says. Do not have much on Twitch no more. We no longer allowed to clip or record Noiki one cry. Oh, yes. So you stopped? Did you stop? No. Oh, that's, that's sad. But then you could just hop to YouTube and stream on YouTube instead. If they allow it. I hope so. Uh, so instead we will be using, which is an open source binary exploitation plugin. No, it's against Twitch toes if we stream music or VODs and clips must be disabled. Okay, okay. Yeah. But you can still do it without, you can do it live, without VODs and clips. But I understand that that's, that's a bit sad, yeah. Yes. But don't most people like just joining the, and see the live stream? Hmm, anyway. So maybe you could like do a stream to YouTube at the same time and they're saved at YouTube. Or will they get strikes there too? I don't know if YouTube it is tricky with that. No idea. Uh, so, 
So let's let's just double check this because I read it in so many bits. Strikes and bans their two YouTube hates live DJs because cannot monetize live. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. It's a tricky. But we pay music publishers to stream on Twitch now. Yeah, so if you pay, why couldn't you just keep it up? That's odd. That's odd. Hmm. So I thought that would be a good thing with the, the DJ thing first, but then it sounds like it didn't go very well. Um, VR Mechatronics says, I built two prototypes in the basement, and I have nowhere to test it. I need to rent a living room somewhere. Okay, okay. Kitty says, Live music has different rule than recorded is confusing Noiki one cry. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's sad. I hope you can get it fixed. I mean, you're not alone in this situation, right? There's a lot of people. Hmm. So, uh, in addition to the debugger itself, we can use we will use Raspberry Raspberry plugin. Uh, and then it says one popular, but then it says it's bad, right? So it mentioned it and says it's bad, and then it says we use this. Uh, so people will know that this is not good <laughs> anymore. X is for DVG plugin. Okie dokie. Oh, installation. All of these tools are already installed on the Windows VM found at the end of the section, which you can connect to from uh, the pawn box with the below command. Um, and it keeps putting my name here. Uh, X3 RDP. Yeah. So it tells us how to use X3 RDP. You can also use the same command in your own Linux VM to connect to the Windows VM. All right, yeah, so I wouldn't use this, of course. Uh, RDP to Windows or Mac. Uh, to connect to the VM from your machine, you must first connect using VPN. Um, Uh, to install access for DVD, we can follow the instructions as shown. Yeah, so let's just read the section I skipped. Uh, yeah, so it ends this section with it's also possible to install on your own Windows VM. Of course. So, uh, I'm kind of thinking it's very warm in here. Should I open the window for a bit? It might be noisy. Just, just a sec. Oh no, right. I'm reorganizing my clothes. So I'd have to reorganize them done before I can open the window. I'll, I'll just open the door. So, it's about one and a half days since I got the training ache. And it's getting worse. <laughs> so, I'm going training later. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> if I can't lift my arms, <laughs> uh, I can't do much martial arts then, can I? To <laughs> uh, <do> install, <laughs> follow the instruction on its GitHub page, and we have it up already. Uh, go to the latest release page and download the snapshot snap set. Let's look at this. So we have releases. Uh, so this is what it looks like at that. Oh no, I smell the piece again when I open the door. Uh, download snapshots. 
Uh, what's with all it? Mm. We can extract the sap. <laughs> extract it somewhere. Uh, move it to program files. <laughs> Why would I want it there? Uh, XDVD comes to separate applications. Okay, so they're separate for 32 and 64 bits. And this is the 32 bit. So it's it's kind of obvious that you download this. I don't need to make notes. Uh, let's no, I can't click the image. Uh, tip. So it when you start it, it creates a desktop. The <laughs> tip to <laughs> use option theme dark. ERC. To install the ERC plugin, you can go to the release page. Big surprise. So instead, we go to the release here. And there's a zip file. Um, let's actually put this in the notes. So. Uh, with the plugin, I guess it's called ERC, but let's actually copy the full thing. So So why? Okay, so these are links, and these are URL links. So these are links within here to a document. Right. Maybe I'll make one for those too, or I will probably do that. Why? Ah, uh, let's continue. So, um, download, extract, uh, put it into plugins folder. Okay, so sixty four or thirty two bits. So now I almost have to install it just to see. Uh, then uh, when that's complete, the plugin should be ready to use. Once we run a 32 dbg, we can type uh, erc help in the command bar at the bottom to view erc's help menu. To view erc's output, we must switch to log tab by clicking alt l. So I can't see this image. <laughs> Why couldn't they make it clickable? So error, the debugger must be attached to a process to use ERC. And it's apparently called ERC. So what does ERC stand for? Exploit development process help. <clears throat> so I can't see what ERC is. Well, 
is part of that, so we don't need to have that up. Uh, we can also set a working directory. ERC config. Uh, yeah, let's let's do a short short note on this. And I guess I will do the same name. So if I click this now, I think it will make one. And did it make it in the right place? No, probably not. <laughs> oh, why am I? Yeah, so so let's just... Yeah, it's in the right place. I was just blind. That's good. So anything else would have been not very smart, right? So first back. Uh, Let's actually cut this and let's actually say S because it is, right? And then we open this as a new tab and we paste this and we do uh, install the latest release. I can't spell release today of x64 pg uh, get uh, erc and put it in the plugins so in plugins um well 32 bit And the same for a 64 bit issue, right? And then we have this is what made me put it in the notes because there's an interesting thing. So, <coughs> PowerShell session. No, I don't have, I don't hate PowerShell. Uh, it's just pretty with SH. So, uh, set the working there. And it's kind of obvious that we wouldn't use HTTP student, right? Uh, now all of your apps should be saved. Uh, yeah, because we put the desktop. <coughs> Debugging a program. However, we want to debug a program, we can either run it through uh, x32dbg or uh, run it separately and then attach to its process. So it's the same as other programs. Uh, to open a program, we can select File Open, Office of 3. Uh, I wanted to attach the program, file attach, or press Alt A. So, <coughs> uh, open file is F3. Let's do it the other way around. And um, Alt A attach to running process or whatever, you know? Oh, it will even give us a, <laughs> a list. Right. 
We can just click something. Then it opens dialog. So we can select the process we want to debug and click attach to start debugging it. If we want to debug a process that's not shown in the attach window, we can try and running it as an admin. Uh, uh, if you can't see the process, run. I guess I'll have to keep typing x64 dbg as admin, right? So good to remember getting help if we want to do we wanted any help with either of these tools we can refer to the documentation okay uh, and erc documentation nice we want these links <coughs> put them over our notes here uh, x64 dvd i'll get very quick at typing this right docs and uh, erc docs placeholder it's always a pretty thing to see So, right, we could actually close these two down. Uh, if you want any help, uh, now that we have all our tools set up, we can start debugging our first software, try and find the Stack Overflow vulnerability and exploit it. Uh, <coughs> Click here to spawn the system. I'm assuming we'll need something basic. Uh, apply what you learn in this module uh, when you try to. What's the name of its process? So we're going to just spawn this to attach to it. That's the only reason. Uh, and we get the, the name of it soon. All right. Uh, we can just close these down. We don't need any notes or anything from these. I hope, like, right? Since I already deleted the other one, which was most interesting. Yeah, so let's uh, clear this and let's do a X free. And I'm going to keep the scale and stuff because it's kind of good. So we'll get an IP soon. Uh, 129.23.22. And <coughs> HTB student. And I guess uh, academy student very advanced password here. <laughs> right, I just realized. So we had it zoomed. We had it zoomed because of that bad one. This is a bit big, right? <laughs> yeah, let's let's scale the desktop. Let's keep it at a hundred percent, right? Uh, let's try this. So 
Uh, so I have it set so that when I make the window bigger, then it will actually... Oh, uh, it should... It should make text fit bigger. Yeah, I think I think I might actually like the other one. Uh, X32 DVD. So let's check the preferences and if we can easily set the font, which I hope. I can't even see this, it's so tiny. Maybe I should have left it at another percentage. That's what I'm thinking. So this is not the kind of settings I want. Theme. It's dark already. It's smart. It realized. Or it's set to that by the machine, of course. They should have done it manually. Or they can have. I think, why ever have a bright light default, right? I'm just checking for font size. So, what if I put the menu up over here? Yeah, that was the bottom. Yeah, let, let's make it easy and actually uh, not 200, but 150%. Well, I guess we could just maximize it with this too. So... What do you think of this? It kind of broke. This is Windows itself. Yeah, I think we'll need to see the full names of things. That's annoying. So what if I restart it now? Yeah, yeah, thought so. That's that's good. Modern, nice software, but the it's it's too high also everything. And because of this, well, I'll, we'll see, we'll see. Anyway, this is so much nicer than than the other one, Immunity Debugger Machine. It was not nice. So we're just supposed to attach to. Uh, free CD to MP3 converter. So uh, let's see. Come on. So refresh and f5 i like it so this is the name they want uh, cd extract Ugh, i can't even reach i can't stretch my arms fully up, all the way out <laughs> so this one is answered they just wanted us to make sure that we could connect that kind of thing um fussing parameters first tech like with perfect also exploration we usually follow five main steps to identify and exploit the buffer overflow vulnerability and this is what was in the cheat sheet here right so we put those in the notes yeah, so it's not just me that is hungry, my tummy also rumbled. <laughs> we'll see if I can wait another half an hour. 
Uh, fussing parameters, controlling EIP, identifying bad characters, finding a return instruction, jumping to shell code. So, fussing parameters. Yeah, so we haven't had to do this really yet because we've been doing simple Linux programs where it's been either the single input that you get to straight when the application starts or a command line argument. So we haven't fussed anything for parameters. Uh, but we've been looking for EAP, we have been identifying by the characters, finding return instruction, and jumping. Well, this is just, do you mean running it then after fixing all this? Or this is getting the information, this is just putting it together? Oh, oh my god! <sighs> Slow, you're coming good back. Yeah, my kid's knocking. Um. Yes.
I seriously, I can't, I can't really move. We'll see how it goes on training. I'm seriously. <laughs> So, <clears throat> uh, usually the first step in binary vulnerability exercise is forcing various parameters and any other input the program accepts to see whether our user or input can cause the application to crash. If any of our inputs successfully causes the program to crash, we review what caused the program to crash. <laughs> if we see the program crashed because our input overrode the EIP register, we likely have a stack based buffer overflow vulnerability. All that is left is to exploit this vulnerability su su successfully, which can uh, vary in difficulty depending on the OS program architecture and protections. Let's start by debugging a local program called which we already attached to uh, identifying input fields or rather I didn't click it because it just wanted to, to have the, the name of it there um, <clears throat> uh, As discussed in the previous session we can either open open our program with or run it separately and attach to it. It's always preferable to run it separately and attach to it to ensure uh, we would debug it exactly as it is when run normally. This may not uh, make a lot of difference for basic programs like this one, but other programs that rely on various libraries may face some differences. Uh, which is why we prefer attaching to a process. Uh, once our debugger is attached to FreeCD2 MP3 converter, we can start fussing various input fields. Depending on the program size, there may be various input fields to fuss. Uh, examples of uh, potential input fields include text input fields, program license registration fields, uh, various fields found in the program's preferences, open files, program arguments, remote resources, uh, any file the program open, various arguments uh, accepted by the program during one time, uh, any files or resources loaded by the program on runtime or on a certain condition. Uh, these are the main uh, parameters we usually fuss, uh, but many other parameters may be exploitable as well. So uh, let's let's take this um, as examples of a GUI programs because it's fields, right? And in our here we have already. Um, user input, command line arguments, network commands, network uh, environment variables. Uh, so GUI, what's the GUI stuff after this? Let's actually wait. <coughs> uh, GUI uh, programs. Um, so I'm thinking, should I make a new header here for with command lines, or should I just make another one here? So these are level four. So let's, let's make this a five. Uh, so it's just an addition. Uh, uh, I don't really like this that it's table. Let's edit it. So let's remove
There's a lot of space here. <laughs> oh? I don't know what I clicked by mistake. I was going to do... Uh, shift control back forward. I don't know what I really did. That's a lot of space. So I'm not sure I like that those are bold, but let's see what it looks like. <coughs> so this has a BR air actually. So it's not very lined up or anything. I might change it later. Um, and actually the... The text too, you know? But let's read this. Uh, these are the main parameters we give with us. Could be other stuff. Uh, let's actually... This means and other stuff, right? Uh, as any program may have many of these types of parameters, and each may have to be fussed with various kinds of inputs, we should attempt to select parameters with the highest possibilities of overflows and start fussing them. We should look for a field that expects short input, like a field that sets a date. As a date usually short, so that the developers may expect a short input only. Another common thing we should look for is fields that are expected to be processed somehow, like a license number registration field, as it will probably be run on a specific function to test whether it's the correct license number. License numbers also tend to have specific length, so that developers may be expecting a certain length only. Uh, and if you provide a long enough input, it may overflow. Uh, the same applies to open files, as open files tend to be processed after being open, while developers may keep a very long buffer of open files. Uh, certain files are expected to be shorter, like configuration files. And if you provide a long input, it may overflow the buffer. Certain file types tend to cause overflow vulnerabilities, like V files or M3U files, due to the vulnerabilities in the libraries that process these types of files. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, let's start fussing some fields in our program. <clears throat> so I'm thinking should I make a note that wave and M3U files M3U files are usually kind of short too, right? But they could be long. Waves are usually long. So fussing text fields. Uh, we'll go through the program's various menu items, and as we just mentioned, the license registration fields are always a good candidate for overflow, so let's start fussing them. I'm like almost, oh, I got an error! <laughs> right? Yeah, so I'm thinking this is time to get started to actually do stuff, and uh, I have to leave in less in an hour i have to leave in an hour but i have to you know help my kids with food eat food myself other stuff too so i'm kind of thinking i'll i'll check let's we'll see who's online uh security weekly i don't think they're really like a stream that is on twitch they will like won't know to read or anything let's see who's, who's just online well, it sees that I'm online this time. I don't think there's a lot of people online. 
So we, we could always raid this dude, but he doesn't speak English, I think. So we, we could always raid this oh, dude. So no one. English, I think. So I don't know why I'm following a lot of people. I don't know what who they are at all. So I don't know why. So this one is one person looking at a Twitch. I think they're mostly YouTube. So this one is one person looking at Oh, I guess I guess we'll just we'll just go there anyway. All right. So security weekly. I'm going back this way. Copy. Uh, let's hop in here. So, uh, let's see. So, <laughs> I'm sorry we don't have anyone good to raid. Do you have any suggestions? I'm sorry we don't have anyone good to raid. Do you have any suggestions? I'm looking once more. Well, we'll we'll continue this tomorrow. Uh, I hope mm, we'll see. Well, we'll yeah, we'll I think I think I will. Uh, I hope a little time. So tomorrow yeah, I'm going to drive my mom to uh, so get her car to service. To so I'm going to drive her from the service then, you know. Uh, so I'll start later. Cybernair Dante says. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a good day. So Thanks later. for streaming. Uh, right. Dante says. Um, have a good day. Thanks did I actually miss? Uh, I don't think I missed any message because I don't have this in my ear. Uh, did I miss? I don't think I for some reason. I don't have the other one here. So I can hear stuff. So, um, yeah, so we'll continue this tomorrow, probably, but a bit later than yeah, so it's we'll not eight. This tomorrow, oh, right, I can hear. I didn't mute myself. So sorry. Uh, I didn't realize. Sorry for that, go. So sorry. Um, yeah, let's let's do the raid. So uh, raid, pacing this dude, and we'll see. Um, I don't think it's not interesting. It's just that I don't think they notice if, if you get a raid or if they have people chatting on 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 Twitch. Maybe they notice chat. Uh, we'll see. Um, and let's go to see on YouTube. So I want to want to send the link to YouTube to two people, two people on YouTube, and we have ten people on on Twitch. So thank you very much for being here, and we'll keep studying tomorrow. <laughs> uh, let's see. I didn't click. So there, the raid is going. So, see you tomorrow, everybody. Though it's kind of early tomorrow, I guess, for some people, maybe. <laughs> so, if not, see tomorrow, the day after. So, I'm going to click the raid now. Let's see, and I'm going to get some food. Thank you, everybody. Person, if the people around you can't trust but turn on the the faucet and drink yeah. the water they're drinking without it being safe, so I think it, 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 what you say is so important. So we're coming up towards the end of the interview, but I want to—I definitely want to um, give you the chance to share a little bit about how people can find out more about ICIT. What are some of the things you guys have upcoming, and uh, where can they get more information? Yeah, 